record it. Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome. Uh, we're glad that you uh, joined us this evening for uh, this is a mountain zoom series on uh, woodland skills and backpacking, and it's going to be heavy on the backpacking. Uh, um, Merle is on here tonight to defend himself. Uh, he, he will be uh, uh, featured uh, in this, and I, I hope that you get a lot out of it. I enjoyed putting it uh, together, so let's see here. Okay, so as far as uh, backpacking itself is concerned, um, sometimes I occasionally get asked the question about why would anybody want to do that? You strap all this weight on your back and you uh, walk through the woods and you're uncomfortable. It's uh, hard a lot of times. And uh, the main reason I usually give is that I, I like to see new places. And it, uh, if it weren't for getting into backpacking, um, I really, I don't think I would have seen most of the, the Northeast. That's really the thing that opened the door uh, to me to give me a reason to go. And I've uh, backpacked the entire Appalachian Trail now, and um, that that by itself represents about six months uh, worth of camping. And um, I'm going to just share with you some of the things that I've learned along the way. <clears throat> so, um, as far as backpacking is concerned, uh, unlike being indoors, uh, I guess it goes without saying that there can be a lot of extremes. And uh, the groups that I backpack with, we've actually been out in the, uh, the woods. Uh, this was up in the Shenandoah in April. It got to 94 degrees uh, for two days, uh, actually three days. <clears throat> and after day number two, uh, we said, um, you know, there were no leaves on the trees yet. So we were really getting uh, sunburned and uh, we had uh, heat exhaustion and um, tingling in our fingers and, and our faces were numb. It, uh, it was really rough, so we called it quits on that trip. Uh, but we've been out when it was down to 13 degrees. Um, we've gone all the way from uh, the, the lowest elevation on the AT uh, is 124 feet. And the highest I've been is to the top of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. And that's over 19,000 feet. And we've gone through snow drifts that were uh, 40 inches uh, deep. Uh, we've had uh, uh, frozen urine bags. And uh, if you want to know more about that, I'll, I'll tell you later. Uh, but we've had hypothermia. Uh, we've been in some really intense winds on Mount Madison in the, the White Mountains. Um, and uh, we've battled all kinds of insects and, and critters. And we've loved every bit of it. Uh, a lot of this uh, is the stories that you get to tell. And uh, I come from a family of storytellers. And uh, truly, um, life is about uh, experiences. And a lot of the experiences that we remember are not pleasant at the time that we are going through them. And it's only later that we feel like, well, that, that's a cool story. And I love to tell the stories about the suffering uh, because for some reason that it becomes funny or uh, a good thing later, <laughs> definitely not at the time. Um, but we've seen all kinds of bears. This is a blurry picture because it was really rainy and there was uh, mist on my camera, but that was a porcupine. Uh, we saw several of them uh, in Pennsylvania. And um, this is a picture of me with my daughter uh, back in the winter of 2016. And <clears throat> the reason it's in here is because that was the winter that was so bad and it was really, really cold. And um, we made a, a snow cave <clears throat> where you pile up uh, all the snow and you uh, dig into it and hollow it out. And um, it, we found out uh, for the first time in my life, I found out just how warm it can be in a snow cave. It, it was almost uh, too warm uh, in there, but it, it made me think about uh, how, how much life is about what we make of it and that what we might think is miserable at the time 
if we persist and uh, look at it a different way, it actually becomes a very positive thing to us, um, something that we learn from. So as far as being self-sufficient in the outdoors, uh, there's four main things that I think are key. Uh, the first one is your mental state, and we'll go in a little bit more on each of these, but your mental state, the preparations that you make, the training that you do, and the equipment or gear that you have with you. So the first thing I'm going to ask is, how resilient are you? Um, it's, it's really about uh, your state of mind, and um, nobody can really change that for you. It's something that you have to uh, change on your own. And if you are mentally weak, and this isn't uh, an insult, uh, just because you're weak today doesn't mean that you're going to be weak tomorrow. Uh, I'm just saying that if you have a, a period of being mentally weak, it really doesn't take much uh, to break you. And it can happen even when things aren't going that bad. Uh, you just, uh, for whatever reason, your mind is somewhere else. Uh, or you just, um, you focus on things uh, that are negative. So if you're mentally strong, uh, you won't break even when things get uncomfortable. And um, I'm going to give some examples. And uh, uh, the first one uh, was uh, from a guy that went with us and uh, we got totally soaked in the Smokies and uh, it was basically seven days of hiking and I think six of those days were fogged in and rainy and that was the last trip he ever went on. Uh, I think he decided uh, at that point that he did not like backpacking and if you think about it that entire decision was based upon one trip. And the Smokies are notorious for getting a lot of rainfall. And so <clears throat> it wasn't totally unexpected that we might get rained on. <clears throat> and this was in May, uh, which happens to be a, a wetter time of the year. So um, um, I, I feel like he picked the wrong time to decide he didn't like it. Uh, we had another guy that went with us when it was uh, a drought year down in Georgia and um, the, all the water sources were dried up. It was incredibly hot. And uh, we had a very pleasant trip as far as the scenery and uh, the nights uh, were pleasant, um, but it was hot during the day. And he just decided that he didn't want to go again. And he had been on several trips uh, with us at that point. Uh, this next one I'm going to skip over for fear that it might incriminate uh, somebody. Um, <clears throat> but in fairness, uh, this was a hard trip on everybody. If I was going to bail, this would probably have been the trip that I would have bailed on because uh, that was really hard. Um, <clears throat> we had another one where uh, this uh, gentleman uh, was going through a divorce. And uh, so he had a lot on his mind and he got really bad blisters and he um, we'd backpacked with him for years and he uh, stumbled uh, a few times on the trail and I, you you could almost see it on his face uh, when he mentally broke and <clears throat> he he didn't come back after that and then we had uh, another guy th this last one that it was also a very, very miserable uh, day. And um, we were expecting to get to this hostel uh, that was in Glencliff. And <clears throat> we envisioned it being uh, really warm and pleasant and a place that we could recover. And when we got there, it was kind of a dump and uh, it was not heated and it was damp and there were dead flies on the beds and <clears throat> Um, it, the, the bathroom was outdoors. Uh, they just had kind of a, one of these, uh, pole tents that was over top of the toilet. And I think the temperatures were in the forties and the rain was blowing in on the toilet. And, uh, that was it for that guy. And so all of these were examples of people that, uh, you know, a bad situation, uh, influenced them permanently. Uh, or at least as far as our group was concerned. So um, 
I kind of thought about all the things that causes a person uh, to, to kind of break mentally. And I think they usually boil down to when um, <clears throat> they focused on what was wrong instead of what was right. And, um, you know, this isn't limited to backpacking in case you haven't noticed. Uh, this has uh, application for the rest of life. If we focus on everything that's wrong, we become very bitter and miserable people in general. And uh, when we focus on what's right, uh, I think of uh, Betty White, who just turned 99. And I don't know that I've ever seen uh, any time in her life that she seemed to be uh, down. Uh, and that has to be because of where her focus is. Um, but it also comes when we lose hope that things are going to improve. And um, <clears throat> um, most of the ones that um, had issues, I think they, they kind of catastrophized. Uh, they started thinking about everything that could go wrong or that everything was going to just get worse. So uh, it also happens when we uh, think uh, that we can't endure or when we decide that the reward um, isn't worth the price that we're having to pay. And so, <clears throat> and that's an individual decision. All these things are individual decisions and, and they're all up to you. And uh, no, nobody can really tell another person um, that they're looking at it wrong. Uh, you could tell somebody that, but ultimately they're the ones that have to make that decision. You can't make it for them. Um, and you don't know what they're dealing with. You don't know that the, the same trip that for me might be easy, might be very hard if you're dealing with something uh, that I don't know about. And so <clears throat> I'm not taking any of that away. Uh, preparation is something that is really important. And uh, so, um, as far as what we need to be prepared, uh, we're going to talk about some of the gear for the conditions and maybe a little bit of the training and uh, anticipating some of the things that can cause a trip to end early. And blisters are something that we've seen uh, cause people to have to get off the trail or um, to just decide that they didn't want to do it anymore. Um, when we first started going on trips, we had really poor footwear and we didn't understand what, how important that was. And we didn't understand what it meant to have shoes that fit properly. Uh, the first trip I went on, I wore some of these rubber duck boots and um, they rubbed blisters that were quarter size on the backs of my heels. And um, I just assumed that that was part of walking a long distance. And I didn't find out till years later um, that if your shoes fit you properly, you should have almost no blisters. And uh, even the ones that you do get, maybe because your feet are sweating, um, can be prevented. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, that was one. But soreness, you can expect that that's going to happen and you can uh, do things to prevent it. Obviously, sunburn, uh, chafing, if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, different people might experience chafing in different places. Uh, I've heard of people that uh, got it under their armpits, uh, but really often uh, people tend to get it in their groin um, or, you know, private places. And uh, it can get really, really, really bad. Uh, we're not uh, talking about just a, a raw place. Um, we've actually had skin peel off um, and just raw meat uh, be under the skin. So uh, that can be a, a really bad problem. Uh, hammer toe is one that we've had people lose toenails and uh, tendonitis was one that caused me to get off the trail at one point um, in my Achilles. So all of these are, are problems that you, uh, you can anticipate. And if you think that you uh, might encounter them, like the tendonitis, I found out that if I stretched properly each morning um, and flexed that heel and tried to get it good and loosened up before I started to walk, I didn't have the problem anymore. Uh, hammer toe, that's about how well your shoes fit and how well you adjust the laces on the shoe. Uh, the chafing, uh, I've actually got some stuff that I discovered. Um, they don't make it anymore, uh, but they have something that is uh, very similar. 
Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you can see this uh, in the, the screen or not, but um, this is called hide repel. And uh, it's, uh, they, there's also things now that are made for runners. I think some people use body glide and different things, but if you tend to get blisters between your toes or if you tend to get chafed, this is like a miracle thing. Um, it's like a lubricant that prevents that. <clears throat> so all of those are just uh, taking steps to make sure that you don't have a problem. Uh, training is one way uh, to get ready for it and to, uh, um, to not have the same level of problems. And the, the main way that you get ready to carry a 30 pound pack in the woods is to carry a 30 pound pack in the woods. And <clears throat> um, it, you can go to the gym, you can do all of these stair climbers and different things, but ultimately uh, I've tried all of those. And the thing that worked the best for me was to just throw on a day pack uh, and go to the woods. And after I got comfortable with that, <clears throat> um, I could change up where I was training. Like I started easy and I slowly started uh, picking places that had uh, steeper climbs and uh, I went longer distances. And um, through the years, we found out what muscle memory is. And uh, your, your muscles um, learn, and, and maybe it's mental too, but uh, you learn uh, that you are capable of doing something. And um, after you know that you're capable of it, it doesn't um, impact you the same way as it would before. Uh, the first trips that we went on were like five to eight miles. And we thought those were really big uh, trips. And um, after we did five to eight mile trips, we slowly started pushing it up to 10 to 12 and then 12 to 14. And each of those trips felt about the same. And we, we did the same training for each. So it didn't really make sense that a 14 mile day would feel the same as an eight mile day. And yet it did. And so we, we even got so far that um, Phil was with us on a trip where we did a, like a 20 some mile day. And then we did another 20 some mile day later and it almost killed us. Uh, that's when we, we got chafed really bad and uh, we were just, uh, suffering, but we did it later and it wasn't, and it was over much more rugged terrain and it didn't have the same effect the second time. Uh, the second time, uh, our muscles knew that they could do it. Our minds knew that they could do it. And we didn't even suffer, uh, when we did it on this trip. So, uh, muscle memory. Um, as far as the training, we usually start three to uh, two, three to four months in advance. And I've got this little uh, regiment that I do that I start off with just little two mile uh, out and back trips uh, that I do uh, twice a week. And usually that's to just slowly break me in. This is usually what I do when it's springtime and I've kind of been uh, idle all winter. And then I kind of bump it up to five miles uh, and just carry about five pounds. And I do this twice a week for about five weeks. And uh, usually five miles is about as far as I ever go. And some of that is because of time. It takes time uh, to walk that far. And if you work, um, there's a limit to how much free time that you have. Um, but uh, what I would do is I would throw in um, a day after that that was focused just on elevation. And so we happen to live in a place that it's pretty easy to get this. Um, if you're over in Wise County, you've got uh, High Knob. And um, I usually have a, a place here above Jenkins that is really, really steep. And uh, we'll train on that one. And <clears throat> it's, um, I think it's about 900 feet in nine tenths of a mile. And so uh, we kind of discovered through experience that if we were able to do uh, one of these and not be suffering too bad when we got home, that we were fairly good to go for most trips. If we were gonna be going somewhere that was really, really steep, um, then we needed to do a little bit more. And we found that if we could do two or three of these back to back, 
uh, and then come home. So you're only talking about four miles of hiking, but it's a lot more elevation gain. Um, that prepared us for the toughest trips that we've ever gone on. And when we did the Whites uh, and when we did Mount Katahdin and most of Kilimanjaro, um, no exaggeration at all, I could actually run up the mountains uh, because I was already uh, conditioned cardio wise and my muscles were already strong enough to do that. And so um, you would think that you would have to, you know, train with boulders and all these things, but uh, this was just on a gravel road, but it was really steep. And then um, three days before the trip, I would say rest. And it's just to make sure that you're not overdoing it uh, before you go. As far as the gear that you're going to take, uh, you don't want it to be any more than 20% of your body weight. We've seen a lot of people that were carrying a ridiculous amount of weight uh, based on how much they weighed. We've seen some pretty petite uh, women on the trail that looked like they were carrying a gorilla and uh, it, it was killing them because it was just too much. And so um, that kind of brings us to base weight. And this is what your pack is going to weigh without the consumables, which is your food, your water, and the fuel. And it's going to, uh, your base weight will be the same uh, almost every trip except for winter time. Um, your consumable weight is going to vary because, you know, if you go on a four day trip or an eight day trip, uh, there's a big difference in the amount of fuel and food that you're going to need. So, as far as that base weight, um, most people are carrying around 30 pounds plus the weight of their food and that's a lot of weight and um, this is what we carried when we first started uh, the very first trip we ever went on i was carrying 52 pounds and um, that was obviously uh, more than uh, 20 percent of my body weight and i was miserable uh, when we would rest, I would just plop down my pack and my face would be beet red and I would just be exhausted. And we slowly started uh, to lessen the weight of our gear. And one of the guys in the group uh, was the first to start doing it. And I noticed that as he did it, he started doing better and better. And I still had my 30 pound, 40 pound, 50 pound pack. And um, so I, the reason why I clung to this was I was paranoid that I had all this gear that I had bought and I had to carry it all. And so um, little by little, I started to learn uh, you, you bought a bunch of things you didn't have to have and you don't need to keep carrying them just because you bought them. And so slowly I, I shrunk the weight down and um, then as gear wore out, uh, we would replace it with lighter gear. And so um, I'm gonna make Merle famous here and uh, play a little video from a trip that we took back in the spring of, uh, la or I'm sorry, in the fall of last year. Just put them on here so they'll dry out for me, hopefully. A little bit. first backpacking trip Chad and I ever went on. <clears throat> we took some youth from church. We did Damascus to Watauga. Yeah. And uh, I had a gold note mine company jacket. It was a, a, a black, you know, like a rain jacket. had the little vinyl symbol on it or something. Right. And I had strapped on the back of my pack. And it was going to be kind of cold and possibly rain. That was a jacket I took. And we got out of Damascus. And by the time we got up the top of the mountain, head toward that Avenue Gap shelter, I was I had a fifty some pound pack. I was in the back, and that jacket was gone. Ah, it was just gone. Well, we're gonna get it on here. Yeah, that broke. I want to get me some duct tape. Put it off there. Come here, Jerry. Help me. No, I'll, I'll do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs>
looking up. Yeah, I gotta get you on video. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell him. See what good help I got? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> You've lost your Greg coat. My Greg fell off. Grab me back in there. <laughs> So, uh, uh, I appreciate Merle being a good sport on this. Uh, I told him today that I was going to uh, share it. Um, Merle was carrying a lot of weight, and I don't know if you saw some of the stuff that he had on the, the back, but, um, you know, that, that takes its toll when you're carrying that kind of weight. And the, the, we'll talk about another thing that he did later, but... Uh, I've already had my fun out of you, Merle, so I'll leave you alone. Um, so as far as essential gear, um, if you don't need it, don't carry it. And uh, I know if you are first getting started, you might not know what you don't need. Uh, but the, the easiest way to do this is uh, only take the things that most of the backpacking list that you would see online, uh, what they would recommend. And then if you go for a couple of trips and you don't use it, uh, don't take it. So uh, it, if you tend to catastrophize, and what I mean by that, if you're like, oh, well, it might get cold or, oh, I might get hungry, I might run out of food or uh, a bear might come along, so I need this uh, hatchet or there might be a, a crazed lunatic in the woods, so I need this big hunting knife and, uh, you know, if you start thinking that way, then you can convince yourself to carry everything under the sun. And so the first few trips, actually for the first probably 10 years that I did this, um, I carried a lot of gear that I just flat out didn't need. And so over time I started ditching it. If it's something that you think that you might need, uh, but maybe uh, you won't use it a lot, uh, you have to ask if there's more than one person in the group uh, does everybody need to carry one? So like a first aid kit, we used to, everybody used to have their own first aid kit. And this was mostly back when we used to have blisters uh, all the time. But as we eliminated the blister problem, we found out that not everybody needed to carry a first aid kit. So we kind of developed this thing where we had community gear and we would weigh out what each of these items were and these would be shared use things and we tried to even it up so that uh, everybody was carrying the same amount but like a water filter you really don't need a water filter for every person um, the stove you could make the case that everybody needs their own stove but if you don't mind waiting uh, a little bit uh, you really only need one stove and you can share it uh, the guides are the same thing uh, so uh, splitting the weight up tents or another thing that if you've got a, a two to three person tent, uh, then that's lighter than everybody carrying a one person tent. Uh, and since we're talking about tents, um, we can talk about whether you really need to take one or not. And uh, I would encourage you to, um, but in certain situations, you might not need it. For many, many years, uh, we hiked on the Appalachian Trail and we did not carry a tent. And we stayed in the shelters that are roughly ever eight to 10 miles on the AT. And um, the, the only concern that you have when you do this is uh, that the shelter might be full when you get there. And then you've got the question, well, what do we do if that happens? So the way we address this is the group that I went with, uh, a lot of them were coal miners and they were used to, to being at work at five o'clock in the morning. So they were very early risers. And we pretty frequently would get up at five o'clock in the morning and we hiked at a good pace. And so we were almost always to the shelter by one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And I believe the latest we ever got to a shelter was around five. And that meant that we beat almost everybody on the trail uh, to the shelter. We didn't have to worry that we wouldn't have space. And one of the guys that went with us, uh, he was always paranoid about the safety of it. And he wanted to be against a wall. 
And um, so we would always have to get there early enough that he could get a spot against the wall. And uh, so, and that was a tradition that carried on for the entire trip. Uh, we did this, but <clears throat> uh, we found over time that most of the, the AT through hikers do not rely on the shelters at all. They all carry their own tents and uh, a good weight for you to shoot for if you're buying one is around three pounds or less. And uh, this would be for a two man uh, tent. And um, if you go any heavier than that, uh, it starts to really add to your weight. And the only thing I can say about this is there's a few pieces of gear that are really expensive and they are um, the ones that you need to shop for the most carefully um, and make sure that you get what you want and they will last for years. And a tent is one of those. Uh, a tent and your sleeping bag are probably the most expensive pieces of gear. And so for a, a three pound tent, uh, something like this, you might spend three to four hundred dollars. And that's that's a lot of money. Um, and you can go cheaper than that, uh, but you you usually have to sacrifice something. Like you might go with a tarp, uh, and by doing that, you're giving up uh, the bug netting and some of the uh, the protection from rain splash. Um, your sleeping bag, um, you know, a good sleeping bag is probably going to run depending on what the temperature rating is. You're probably looking at somewhere around 280 to to $400 for a good sleeping bag. And that's for a, a down sleeping bag. If you go with, uh, you know, synthetic, uh, those tend to be bulkier. So they take up a lot more space in your backpack and they also tend to be very heavy. And so, uh, but uh, th th I just wanted to talk about that briefly since we were on the, the expensive gear. Um, other reasons for taking a tent is if something happens, let's say you turn your ankle and you can't make it to the shelter. Uh, or if you get confused, you make a wrong turn and you're gonna get to the shelter after dark. Um, having your own tent gives you that emergency shelter. It also provides insect protection. Yeah, um, and if you're paranoid about spiders and snakes and all that kind of thing, then uh, a tent is a great way to go. Um, also gives you the choice of camping at better locations. Uh, this uh, spot where this picture is taken is Antlers Campsite. Uh, it's on Joe Mary Lake up in Maine. And this is hands down the most beautiful place that I have ever camped. And um, uh, just, uh, I would camp there every night if I could. It, it's a, on a peninsula that sticks out into a lake and there's loons on the lake and it was just phenomenal. And there wasn't a shelter here. So having a tent allowed us to stay where we wanted to stay, uh, which was really nice in this instance. Uh, but it also provides more warmth. So those shelters, they really don't add anything other than that they let you get in out of the rain. Uh, but temperature wise, whatever the outside temperature is, is what it's gonna be in that shelter. Uh, but with a tent, they're small enough that uh, they raise the, you know, your body uh, temperature uh, they kind of hold that in a little bit, like a little cocoon, and <clears throat> they uh, uh, make it a little warmer than it would be uh, just outdoors. Uh, they also provide uh, privacy and solitude. So if you don't want to be around other people, uh, or maybe you don't want to change clothes around other people, uh, or maybe you don't want to sleep co-ed because the shelters, it tends to be men and women, and sometimes people snore and uh, that can be uh, monotonous. Um, a tent is definitely the way to go. And then during all this COVID and, uh, you know, there's been norovirus outbreaks on the trail before, um, definitely the tent, you don't have to worry so much about uh, health issues. Um, and one more thing, I, getting back to the, the insects, um, it tends to not be as big a deal around here, but uh, we have on the Ridge Trail that is down between Cumberland Gap and uh, Ewan, uh, Virginia, we've run into uh, really bad black fly problems in the spring. Uh, 
in this particular photo, um, Ross had 30 mosquitoes on him and we had just come from this spring down behind him and they were awful. Just, you, you couldn't get ahead of them and they, they seemed to love the backs of your arms. They knew that they could get there and, and be safe. So the, the tent helps with that. As far as your clothing goes, uh, you have to ask uh, what, what's the weather gonna be and are you sure? And we have many times uh, gone on trips that the forecast was for it to be uh, clear the whole time and it ended up raining every other day. And uh, we've had trips that the, the low uh, was supposed to be down in the 40s and instead it got down into the teens. And uh, some of that had to do with the fact that we were up higher than we thought we were gonna be. And uh, so the temperature drops three to four degrees for every thousand feet of gain. And uh, so uh, make sure that you've got adequate clothing for the extremes that might happen in that season. And um, you'll, you'll be glad that you did that. Um, as far as the, the weight goes, uh, I've, I've got uh, the, the biggest weight killer is yet to be named, but um, clothing is the second biggest weight killer. Uh, so people tend to pack too many clothes. And I don't mean that you shouldn't take a jacket. I don't mean that you shouldn't take long johns, but you do not need five pairs of socks and you don't need five pairs of underwear or a, a change of clothes for every day. Um, so uh, a pair and a spare is all you really need for almost any trip. And um, you, you have one pair on uh, and the other pair uh, you have washed out and you're letting them dry. Uh, hopefully it's something that's synthetic so that it will dry pretty uh, quickly. Um, but um, even if they start to get a little funky, Usually we can get uh, at least two days and some day, sometimes uh, three days out of a, a change of clothes. So if you've got uh, two pairs, that's six days worth of clothes. And um, probably the only time that there could be an issue is if it's really, really wet and it stays wet, uh, you might get into a situation where uh, your uh, clothes are wet. And what I would advise then is that you wear one pair and keep the spare uh, for when you get to camp so that you've got something dry to put on uh, when you tend to get chilled. Um, remember that cotton kills. Don't, don't take anything that's cotton. Don't take socks, t-shirts, uh, underwear, or anything that's cotton. It tends to hold moisture and uh, it rubs when it gets wet and it also quits insulating. So it will uh, cause you to get uh, hypothermia uh, when you normally wouldn't. So, uh, you know, there've been trips that I've had on synthetics and I was wet and I was still toasty, uh, but with cotton, uh, we uh, got hypothermia. Make sure that you dress in layers and uh, dressing in layers is more important than having on a really thick uh, layer of any one uh, piece. Um, I kind of found this out on, on one trip where I had on a, a down coat and um, I was too dependent on that down coat uh, for all my warmth and uh, found out pretty quickly that it, um, it's better to have on a couple of long johns that are uh, a synthetic or a wool blend uh, than it is to have on that really bulky coat. Um, but generally uh, a hat or a cap and by cap that could be a stocking cap or a toboggan uh, and the hat, some people like ball caps. Uh, I wear a, a, a boonie, I like a military boonie. Um, tops, uh, in the summertime, it can just be a, a, a polypropylene uh, or um, other synthetic uh, t-shirt, or it can be um, long sleeve. You know, they've started coming out with new blends now, but uh, it really, it's weather dependent. Um, gloves or mittens if it's a uh, cooler time of the year uh, you'll find pretty quickly that even if it's in the 40s uh, if your hands are on hiking poles or something gloves become really important um, underwear of course 
uh, bottoms or shorts. I go with cargo pants because I like to be able to zip off the bottom part of the of the pants and, and turn them into shorts. And socks, uh, if you've never heard of the company Darn Tough, uh, they, they make a really good wool sock, but so does Thorlo, uh, so does Smart Wool. Uh, the wool socks are great. And then uh, night clothes, and I usually just wear long johns uh, that are synthetic uh, long johns. Uh, and mostly I do this because you get sticky and greasy. And um, you tend in all your flex uh, points, like in your arms and the backs of your legs, uh, you tend to get really sticky there. And uh, it can cause you to not be able to sleep very well. So if you put those long johns on, it, it helps make that a little more bearable. As far as the sleeping bag, uh, you know, it's gonna be temperature dependent. Um, I've got a really, uh, I think the coldest bag that I've got is a 20 degree bag, and then I've got a 30 and a 40. And I've got an insert uh, that I can put inside of any of those that adds another 15 degrees. And so uh, I guess the, the reason I did that was because going to a, a zero degree bag uh, was very expensive. That's almost $500 uh, and, and more uh, to get one that goes that low. And the trips that we go on, I really don't like being out in the weather when it's less than about 25 degrees. Um, so we've kind of cut out those severe trips if we have a choice. Um, most all of our group has gone with down sleeping bags instead of synthetic just because they pack down smaller and they're uh, lighter weight. Uh, the drawback to them is, is if they get wet, um, you've got a problem because they lose their insulation. And um, um, if you are meticulous about not getting against um, uh, places that can be wet, and if you uh, pack them in a garbage bag before you put them down in your backpack, you shouldn't have any problems. And we, we backpacked for um, probably 18 years with down sleeping bags and we only had one get wet one time and it wasn't because of anything we did. We had a, a guy that came in uh, to the shelter that um, had apparently been with a bunch of guys that got drunk and uh, he left them and came up to the shelter to sleep and um, he was soaked and had no sleeping bag. And um, I kind of put my sleeping bag over on him and uh, we were getting up early anyway. And uh, that's the only time I had a, a sleeping bag to get wet. Um, but a pad is also something that you'll want. Uh, you can either go closed cell or inflatable. And um, the inflatable here uh, is a big Agnes. And um, you, you can research, there's a bunch of different brands, but um, these make a huge difference in how well you will sleep at night. And then the pillow is up to you. I have used a jacket as my pillow before, but I've got a little um, Sea to Summit uh, inflatable ultralight pillow now uh, that I, I really, really like. Uh, but uh, you can go with anything uh, that you want. I've had multiple pillows. Um, so as far as footwear, uh, that's a very, very important decision. Um, if you haven't heard the expression before, they say that a pound on your feet is equal to five on your back. And I believe that that's totally true. When we first started, we wore uh, full leather boots. They weighed four to six pounds for a pair of boots. And um, I thought that that was a necessity to keep my feet uh, dry. And I learned over time that it didn't work that my feet got wet anyway. Those boots are extremely expensive. Uh, you're talking about like $300 for a really comfortable uh, pair of solid leather hiking boots. And um, so I kind of transitioned to hybrids uh, because I still didn't trust uh, the trail runners. And, um, and I was fine with these and I still use them uh, in the winter time. Um, I've got a pair of hybrids that I backpack in the snow in. But uh, for almost everything that we do, trail runners is the way to go. And the reason is these new shoes are so lightweight 
and they are so breathable that even if they get totally wet, uh, it doesn't take them very long at all to dry back out. Whereas these boots, when they get wet, your feet are gonna be wet the rest of the trip. These, if your feet get wet, they might be wet for just a couple of hours and then they dry back out. So um, I, I'm a big fan of the trail runners. And I know some people are worried about turning their ankles. Um, I turned my ankles, I've, I've turned both of my ankles really bad before, uh, not on the trail. Uh, one was playing basketball and another time I was jumping off of a buddy's uh, porch. And um, the, when I jumped off the porch, it, it actually cracked. Uh, I could hear my ankle snap and I was on crutches uh, for uh, I think six weeks. And so um, I know people talk about having weak ankles and, and uh, worrying about uh, rocky places. Um, I wouldn't say that I've got weak ankles, but I have turned both of them. Um, but we we used trail runners through the worst parts of the AT. Uh, we went through the Mahusik Notch, which is nothing but a boulder field. Uh, we went up Katahdin, uh, everywhere that we've been, uh, we've done in trail runners and we, we've never had anybody turn their ankle. Um, so other things that you might want to consider is gaiters. These are things that go, uh, between your pants and the top of your shoe. It's kind of like a little skirt of a thing that keeps uh, debris from getting down in your shoe. Some people have problems with it, some people don't. Um, I always seem to get gravels and sticks down in my shoe and I don't like having to stop every mile to dig something out. So I do wear gaiters. And then if you're gonna be going out when there's snow or ice or something, uh, they have these things called micro spikes that go on your shoes uh, that give you traction. So um, one of the easiest ways to cut your weight down on your pack is to uh, go with um, a lightweight backpack. The first pack that I ever carried weighed nine pounds empty. And um, uh, the guy that I told you about that was cutting his weight down, he started going with a lighter uh, backpack and I, I thought, oh, you're going to you're going to regret that. And uh, as I said, he, he was happier and I was exhausted. So I upgraded and I, I still didn't trust those lightweight backpacks. And so I got one that was highly rated, but still weighed seven pounds. And um, everybody else's pack was consistently weighing five pounds less than mine. And I just could not figure out how they were doing it because we had the same basic gear. And ultimately, it came down to the backpack. And so uh, when that backpack uh, got kind of, um, I think I had it a couple of years, and I sold it on eBay. And I took the money from what I got out of this backpack, and I was able to buy a two-pound backpack um, and had money to spare. So uh, and this two-pound backpack uh, is still the one that I carry. And uh, that's, that's about as low as you can go uh, without getting into the ultra light gear that is um, maybe not quite as durable. And it just, it depends on how much you trust it. But uh, two pounds is a good weight for a backpack for me that, anymore. Um, I keep a spreadsheet where I track the weights of all my gear. I've got a little set of digital scales and everything that I buy, I weigh it and I, I put it in that spreadsheet. And then if I have a piece of gear that I'm gonna replace or I'm talking uh, or thinking about upgrading, um, I'll take that with me and any new piece of gear that I get has to weigh less than what I had before. And so uh, that becomes a, a handy thing. And it also helps you when you're packing your, your pack um, to know how much everything weighs independently. So uh, you can get a little set of digital scales for like around 20 bucks on Amazon and uh, it helps you uh, pack wisely. And uh, remember that gear can be expensive, so make sure you research it carefully. As far as food, um, usually one and a half to two pounds of food per person per day is what you'd need to be carrying. I would recommend that you sample foods before you go on any trip. We found out the hard way that uh, some of the meals, um, we were very hungry at the end of the day 
and we would cook something and it was just nasty or it was really, really spicy and we couldn't eat it. And so that's, that's really bad uh, when you get to your destination and you can't eat your meal. So um, try, try to sample some of them before you go. As far as some of the options that we take, uh, we have for years uh, used Carnation Instant Breakfast and uh, some uh, dehydrated milk, and we would repackage it in a Ziploc bag, uh, and that would be enough for a quart. And then I would mix in like some uh, Reese's cereal, uh, Reese's cup cereal with it, and uh, uh, I, I like that meal. Uh, it gives you a quart of liquid right off the bat in the morning. Uh, probably the only time this is a bummer is when it's cold weather and chugging a quart of cold uh, liquid uh, can get you pretty cold. But for warm weather, that, that's a great one. Uh, they do also make a, um, a really good meal that I discovered recently um, that is uh, Backpacker Pantry and uh, Mountain House, there's uh, Alpine Air, there's several different brands, but they've got these uh, prepackaged um, uh, oatmeals and uh, with nuts and berries and things, or you can do your own. Uh, but uh, Pop-Tarts, we've tried all of those things and all of them work great. Uh, for, for lunches, we, to cut down on our fuel weight, we usually do a cold lunch so it's usually a sandwich and uh, just some snacky type things, cheese and crackers, some jerky, um, maybe peanut butter and jelly, uh, that kind of thing. And then for dinners, um, you know, we've tried all different kinds of meals. Absolutely best meal I ever had uh, was a backpacker pantry meal that had, it was uh, salmon pesto. Uh, and for whatever reason, uh, they don't have it available right now. Um, but that one was really good. But there's all different brands, uh, Mountain House. Um, this is one, uh, chicken pesto pasta that I'm getting ready to try. But uh, what you're looking for is uh, just making sure that you're getting the, the right amount of calories. And most, most hikers are going to burn four to 5,000 calories a day. So don't, don't try to skimp on the weight of your meals. Um, I'm not going to tell you to take too much because uh, food is the biggest weight killer if you try to take too much. But just make sure that you're getting the right number of calories and you ought to be able to do that around the two pounds of food per day. Um, most people take uh, too much and snacks is usually where they make the mistake. They take too much chocolate, too much jerky, too much cheese and all these things accumulate. And I know you don't want to be out on the trail and not have food. And, um, you know, there's always a possibility that you might get hurt or you might get sick or something like that. And you, you need to have an extra meal or so uh, just to tide you over in case you have to spend an extra uh, day. But don't get crazy about it. Um, you know, really one or two extra meals is all you ever uh, should have to take and um, that that was our experience anyway. So as far as some of the other gear, uh, headlamps uh, are really handy when you're around camp to not have to hold it and uh, some these come in all different weights. Try to get one that's fairly lightweight and when I say knife I'm not talking about a Jim Bowie uh, uh, tactical knife. I'm talking about a little uh, one of these little pin knives. Uh, because that's really all you need. Um, a stove and the stoves are uh, usually the ones that we take are canister stoves. You can use alcohol stoves uh, and all different things. Um, but the, the one that we have consistently carried is a Snow Peak. And I believe this one weighs uh, three ounces uh, without the, um, the canister. You can see that it's it's a little lightweight thing and it just screws down on the top of that bottle and you, you set your pot on top of it, if you all can see that. Um, but these are really handy. I know uh, jet bull stoves are really popular on the trail and uh, there are some that are a little uh, 
micro versions that, uh, you know, it, it really depends on how lightweight you're willing to go uh, and the fact that you do sacrifice stability sometimes when you start getting too small, uh, but that's a personal preference and um, uh, that's up to you. Um, you want to make sure that you've got at least two different kinds of way to light your stove and a fire. Um, our stoves have a little piezo lighter on them that helps us uh, start them up, but we also carry an extra big lighter uh, with us just in case. Uh, fuel, usually one of those little fuel canisters uh, is enough to do us for, um, uh, it seems like we've done four days uh, and that includes your meal plus uh, either tea or hot chocolate uh, with one of these little seven ounce uh, canisters. So uh, that's, that's really a, a good thing. It doesn't weigh a lot, uh, but a pot, um, it's up to you if you use aluminum or titanium. Uh, the titanium is expensive and maybe you work your way up to that, but gloves, your phone, paper, pen, maps, uh, guides of the area that you're going to be hiking in and a compass. Um, there have been people that have been lost on even well-used trails like the AT. Um, and um, we had a lady that was from Tennessee that uh, stopped uh, off the trail to use the bathroom and got turned around. And um, I believe she had read that if you get lost to just uh, stay where you are and wait on somebody to find you. And her husband was waiting at the next road crossing. Uh, he was kind of supporting her as she went. And when she didn't show up, um, he alerted the authorities. Uh, but I believe they suspected foul play. They thought that he had done something and uh, he hadn't. Um, but she stayed in her sleeping bag uh, in her tent for 16 days and uh, uh, died. Uh, so um, and she, the reason why we know what happened to her is she kept a journal. And um, so I would just encourage you to take a compass and take maps and guides and um, be prepared to find your own way out. That's part of that self-sufficiency. Uh, lip balm, sunblock, insect repellent. You can, I'm not gonna read them all to you, but you can kind of see some of the things down through here that we took. There's always a question about whether to take something to protect yourself with. And uh, we've never taken bear spray. Um, we've had uh, black bears that have bluff charged us before in the Shenandoah and uh, up in um, New Jersey. We had one uh, with cubs that was really close to us, but we never had a problem with black bears. And as far as people, we were always in a group of at least two and sometimes three or four. And so we, we almost never carried a gun or anything, but uh, that's totally up to you. You are responsible for your own safety. And so if that's what helps you feel comfortable, uh, then I would tell you uh, to do it. Uh, but um, keep in mind that that's extra weight. Uh, hand sanitizer is always important even before uh, COVID, uh, just because uh, your hands get really grungy and uh, you don't really have the means to wash up uh, as well out in the woods. And so hand sanitizer before you eat, and then they, they make these uh, biodegradable soaps. You can get them at Walmart or the outdoor store. And uh, washing your hands before you eat is very, very important for the norovirus and other things. Uh, obviously toilet paper. Um, as far as where to go, um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to go through this. This is McAfee Knob. It's over in Virginia, uh, up by Roanoke. This is the most photographed place on the Appalachian Trail. And um, this picture was taken this past year. Uh, when we originally went over it, it was fogged in and we couldn't see it. Um, so we went back to redo this section and it's beautiful. Uh, and Merle can tell you there were probably 300 people at this uh, place on the way. Uh, we either saw that many going up or coming down or in the general area. There was a lot of people. Um, other places that I think are really, really good uh, that are uh, close by 
uh, on the Appalachian Trail is uh, Grayson Highlands State Park back down to Damascus. That's a beautiful hike. Um, US uh, 19E, which is just east of Elizabethan. Um, uh, it's near Rhone, uh, North Carolina, or I guess it's North Carolina, it might be Tennessee. But from US, or US 19E to Irwin, Tennessee is a beautiful hike. And then Parisburg uh, up to Delville is also a beautiful hike. If you wanna stay really close, uh, the Pine Mountain Trail, the Highlands section and the Little she uh, Shepherd sections are both spectacular. And uh, you will probably have most of these trails to yourself um, or very few people. And so if you're trying to get away from the crazy, this is a, a great place to go. And uh, this Little Shepherd section has just been added and uh, there are phenomenal views and it's a pretty easy hike. So uh, if you were looking for a place to start off, uh, just to get your feet wet of all the places, I would say go do the Little Shepherd section. It's, it's really good. Uh, the Birch Knob section is another good one, uh, but there are uh, uh, some issues with it right now as far as part of it being officially closed and um, some of the trail has not been dug out. It's blazed really well. Uh, and we have people that are using it anyway, uh, but uh, there might be a little portion of it for about a mile that you would have to uh, go cross country. And then there are also some issues uh, down towards the brakes with illegal ATVs uh, on uh, federal and state lands. So uh, that's kind of a, a little hit against it. Uh, the Ridge Trail is another good one there at Cumberland Gap and, and Ewing. As far as multi-day hikes that are farther away, uh, I really can't say enough about uh, the 100-mile wilderness from Monson, Maine to Katahdin. Uh, it's just spectacular. Um, and the, these are some pictures that are from up uh, on the ascent up Mount Katahdin or from the main top. And you're just looking at uh, these uh, granite uh, peaks and all these uh, glacial ponds uh, or lakes, and uh, they're, they're beautiful. And uh, if you'll listen, uh, this was our last night on the AT. This is at Rainbow Lake, and these are loons. I had waited my entire AT hike to get to hear those and didn't think I was going to get to. But on the last night of the hike, uh, we had uh, these start calling and then we had some moose that came into camp. Uh, so a uh, really uh, great place. Um, the presidentials um, up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, I, I would rave about that. Uh, it's really, really good. Uh, but this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, I would work my way up to this uh, because it is incredibly difficult. Um, so make sure that you've trained and, and hiked in some other places first. Uh, the Bigelows in Maine are also beautiful, tough, but beautiful. Um, some other places that we really, really liked, uh, doing the length of the Shenandoah is really good. Uh, doing the length of the Smokies on the AT is really good. Uh, there are some excellent trails in Yellowstone and Glacier. Uh, there are uh, rim to rim trails at, at the Grand Canyon. And then up at Denali, if you really get adventurous up in Alaska, all of those are great. As far as uh, when to go, um, this, this particular picture uh, was taken, um, uh, and I'm, I apologize, I can't give the photographer credit because I can't remember exactly who it was, but uh, this was taken with the most recent comet up above Whitesburg, and I think that is just a phenomenal photo. I don't know if it was Brad Deal or, or who took the, the photo, but it was spectacular. Um, but any time that uh, you can uh, get out when, um, the, the weather is good, so the spring is great for flowers after a long winter. The fall is great for the leaves and for temperatures and dry weather. 
If you're looking for a really good forecast for anywhere that you're going to go uh, with mountains, uh, this website, uh, mountainforecast.com, you can uh, search for the mountain that you're going to go to and uh, it will give you the forecast for that mountain. And so what we would do is if we were going out for a longer trip uh, and there were multiple mountains involved, we would just enter two or three of those you know, one at the beginning, one at the middle, and one at the end, and we would kind of uh, get a feel for what the forecast was going to be. But anytime there's a, anytime there's a special event, like a full moon uh, or a comet, a meteor shower, lunar eclipse, anything like that is great. Um, try to avoid the peak times for insects and yellow jackets, uh, which would be um, July and August. Um, it's also when those little spiders like to build webs across the trail. And so you're constantly uh, knocking spider webs down if you go during that time. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that there are certain times of the year that you're more likely to encounter crowds. So there's a wave of through hikers that come through and uh, any of the major holidays uh, can be really crazy like uh, Memorial Day weekend or the 4th of July, uh, Labor Day, uh, Columbus Day, those are, uh, Columbus Day is a really big holiday up north. And so uh, I would say avoid those if you can. And if you have a choice, if you can go during the week, you can usually get rid of the weekend crowds. Uh, you also need to know when the hunting seasons are, and those are available for each of the states online. If you want to check those out. Um, this is a picture of Katahdin from Abal Bridge. Uh, and uh, uh, the picture doesn't do it justice. It was incredible. It's all above tree line. And if you think of something later, uh, here's my contact information. And um, I'm going to stop the share and uh, ask if there are any questions. I think you can unmute yourself. So you climbed Mount Kilimanjaro? I did. Awesome. How long did it take and were you with a group? Um, it took, um, let's see, it took uh, two days to get there. I guess we, we flew at night from Atlanta and um, I think it was uh, all night long to get to um, uh, um, Amsterdam and then another uh, most of the day to get down to Tanzania. They picked us up at the airport and we had I think uh, two full days to uh, just recover and then uh, the trip itself uh, was I think seven days. It might have been eight um, and then um, two days after to get home and um, we, there is a, a, a multiple uh, guide services that will uh, um, help you. The one we went with was uh, Can Do and it's K-A-N-D-O-O -O Adventures. And uh, if you uh, search for them online, uh, they, they do multiple trips uh, all over the world uh, to Everest and uh, to uh, uh, down into South America and they tell you everything that you need to bring, uh, all the gear that you're going to need. Uh, it was really a, an awesome experience. And um, the only thing that I could say is that um, it was a great trip for me until summit day. And summit day uh, was very, very difficult. Um, they had us on medication for the, the oxygen. Uh, being lowered and uh, um, I was taking that but I also wore a, um, a face uh, like a, one of these neck gaiters and I think that's what the problem was was that it, I wasn't getting enough oxygen and um, I basically slept walked up the mountain and I was just right on the verge of collapse the whole way up and there were other people in the group that were not near as fit as I was, I thought. And um, 
they they didn't have any trouble at all. So <laughs> it, it affects different people differently, but uh, it was uh, the chance of a lifetime uh, to get to go do that. And so I, I would highly recommend it. Any other questions? Guys, are the rest of you on here? All right, good. I still see you. It's a good talk, Chad. I enjoyed it. All right, it's Merle. Merle hasn't pouted. I've lost my audio or video. I can't see. I can see y'all, but I. I ain't on there. Something happened to mine. Yeah, tell them, Chad, that I didn't have nobody didn't carry my backpack. <laughs> Merle did great. He uh, he he was carrying about ten days worth of food on a uh, a four day trip. Um, yeah. But other than that, he did great. <laughs> nobody starved, did they? No, they didn't. He was trying to give food away the entire trip. Um, but he, he did really, really well. And I presume most of his food was in tin cans, huh? Nope. <laughs> most of it was sticker bars and uh, various candy bars and jerky. Now that's, now that's being prepared, Merle. I like that. Well, that kept me going. When you get old, you got to have something like that, you know? <laughs> You know, when I went on this, I was 70 years old. And he had no trouble whatsoever keeping up with us. How old are you, Chad? <laughs> I'm, I'm 48. Uh, so, uh, and close, he, 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 close to 70. Uh, I've got a ways to go. You you did very it's not well. Too late for me, then. Say that again. So it's not too late for me then. No, it's not too late for you at all. There's, um, um, I'm trying to think of what the record seems like there was a guy that was 87 that has through hiked the Appalachian trail and he did it all in six months. So one big continuous hike. And, um, we routinely see people in their eighties, uh, out on the trail. And I, I don't think you're anywhere near 80. Uh, if I was guessing, I'd say you're in your sixties maybe, but, uh, uh, you're, you're That's not, not far off. All right. Well, you you uh, you still got twenty years, at least. Um, but I, I think uh, if you get into it, you'll find that there is uh, liberty that comes from knowing that you've got everything that you need. And the, the, I guess the one last parting thing that I would say is, it helped me mentally to simplify life. Uh, that all the things that we think we have to have, we really don't have to have. And uh, all that you really have to have, you can carry on your back. So. All right. Well, that's all I've got. Um, guys, what do we have coming up next? Um, I believe on Tuesday we have uh, Dr. Daryl Jones from Mississippi State University Extension. He's going to be talking about uh, leasing, uh, recreational leasing. So if you own land, uh, how to re lease that for hunting or hiking or bird watching or whatever other kind of recreational use uh, you might want to look into. And uh, is Thursday, is that uh, your speaker, the uh, freezer bag cooking? Is that coming up Thursday? Martha Yon. Yes. We need to check with her, Jeremy. I've not, um, I've not talked to her in a little while, but we need to confirm that one. Uh, but Martha will be great. Um, so I, both of those will be excellent talks, I'm sure. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, I know we've kept you a little late tonight, so uh, we'll part ways. But uh, thank you for tuning in for. Uh, this mountain zoom and have a good evening. See you, everybody. See you. Thanks, Ash. See you guys and gals. <laughs>